All right, welcome to uh, Logic Design for April the 24th. And good, and we're working. All right, so what we're gonna cover today is Unit 16, so I'll shrink myself down. And um, I think you'll find that this will be uh, um, a pretty, uh, this will be pretty full. So we have a lot of material to cover and I'm just gonna get at it here. Okay. Uh, we will have the help session. Uh, let's see when that help session is. We usually do the we do the help session on Wednesday at noon. Um, and so let me know if if you if if that works for you. Next week, I'll, uh, so next week we'll be finishing up hopefully everything. Uh, so Monday, Wednesday, Friday, and then. Uh, and then we'll do some, and, and also do uh, some review next week. And hopefully, by the time we get to the end of the week, you'll be ready for the final. So, uh, yeah. All right. So, here we go. So, um, actually, I didn't need to click on it, did I? Should have worked without it. Okay. So, we're gonna we're gonna t we're gonna review some more sequential designs. The first thing we're gonna do is this code converter example. Remember the XS3 problem? We've, we've, we've actually done this a bunch of different ways, at least two or three already, and we're going to do it one more. And I, I don't know if that's a good thing or not. I, I'm really, I don't like this problem, but anyway, because I have no idea what XS3 really has ever been used for. But in, but in any event, uh, that's what we're going to do. But this time we're doing it differently, okay? We're going to take the values in one bit at a time. And... Uh, as we take in the values, we're going to see if we're able to shift out a bit as we go. And uh, so we'll see. Um, once we do that, then we'll talk a little bit about uh, iterative design. And uh, we've already talked about that a little bit with adders, and we'll talk about that a little bit more. And then uh, we'll show how we can do this code converter example. Initially, we'll do it in our standard way, but then we'll show how we can use a read-only memory and uh, implement, implement it that way. And I think you'll find that interesting. Uh, of course, it, besides the ROM, it does take uh, some flip-flops because you have to remember the uh, the state you're in, and you can't really use the ROM to do that because you have to you have to they have it has to be dynamically changeable, and the ROM typically can be changed, but not 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 fast. Typically, you have to program it. It takes a little bit of time to do that. Um, and we'll talk briefly about complex programmable logic devices and field programmable gate arrays. I'm not going to spend a lot of time on these. Uh, FPGAs are really important. CPLDs are pretty important. Programmable uh, logic stuff, other the smaller units that used to be used extensively are no longer really used that much. So, uh, but FPGAs are used extensively and will be more and more. Uh, they are very powerful devices, and probably eventually almost everything is going to be more like an FPGA. Even a microprocessor. Well, I don't know if we'll completely go to FPGAs uh, because micros are still going to be uh, a lot smaller and cheaper. But uh, believe it or not, you can take an FPGA and you can implement on a typical, uh, you know, frontline FPGA, not even top of the line, just, you know, one of the contemporary chips. You can probably implement five or six cores on it uh, uh, if that's what you wanted to do. So pretty amazing. Anyway, and then we'll talk a little bit about simulation testing and computer-aided design. We'll briefly mention those. All right, so code converter problem. Well, so here's the summary. We've been through this before. Uh, there was some uh, confusion about this, uh, but let's just go through it again to make sure you understand it. So we have a problem statement, and typically uh, you either do a state table. If it's a really big problem, you may do a state table first and not a state graph, but typically we do the state graph first and then the state table. Then we reduce the state table and then after we have reduced the state table to a minimum number of states, then we think about flip-flop state assignment. And we consider possibilities. Maybe if we're doing programmable logic, we'll do the one hot assignment where we have a flip-flop for every state and only one is on for any given state um, and the, all the others are off. And then uh, otherwise we'll talk about, uh, we'll review the guidelines for how we should uh, organize our, our encoding for our states on our flip-flops. Um, and we covered those. Uh, we covered those on Wednesday. Uh, so once we get our, our our code for our flip flops for our states, we substitute that into the state table, and that turns it into a transition table. So uh, 
and then we plot the k-maps and then we simplify the k-maps and we uh, well we plot them for the flip-flop uh, we use if we're using these we just have to do we just have to do the next state maps uh, if we're doing T's or JK's, then, then we have to do the additional columns and plot those. But in any event, we plot the K-maps after we get the transition table set up. And then finally, uh, we uh, minimize the equations and realize the gates uh, with the uh, equations from the K-maps. And then obviously the last step would be to verify the design and test, uh, with, test it with either uh, by building a, a hardware a hardware example a prototype or maybe simulate it in a simulator okay so let's look at this code conversion problem so first the problem statement okay so here's the problem we're gonna we're gonna take binary coded decimal and turn it into xs3 and we're gonna convert four bits uh, from an input stream the four bits will represent our binary coded decimal when we have a four bit binary coded decimal we represent 0, 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, 7, 8, 9. We still have codes because it's a 4-bit value, so, that, so we still have all 16 hex values, which would include 10, 11, 12, 13, and 14, and 15, or A, B, C, D, E, F. But, we're, but those become don't care. So those are inputs that should never occur because we don't, uh, there's, decimal only has uh, 10 digits, 0 through 9. So we normally just, and then our X is three code, we basically add three to the BCD. So zero then becomes three, one becomes four, two becomes five, and so forth, all the way up to nine becomes 12, or uh, C, if you wish. Anyway, so we're gonna, we're gonna start to simulate the input stream, and we'll make a table with all the possible input sequences and all the desired output sequences, and we'll see if we're able to output a value as soon as we get a value in. So we get a bit in. C can we know at that moment what the first bit in the XS3 code should look like? So that's a question, rhetorical question, because we're going we're gonna to look at that. All right. So here is, uh, this is sort of a, a way to think about the problem. This is not our state table, okay? Well, maybe in a way it is, I guess. Uh, so here's our input X x3, 2, 1, 0, and here's our output z, z3, z2, z1, z0. So if we have all zeros, we should represent that as a 3. If we have a 1, we should represent that as a 4. If we have a 2, that should be a 5. If we have 3, that should be 6, and so forth. Uh, all the way down to 9, which should be uh, c, or uh, 12. Now, so we, we need this table, though. We're Remember, these it's not really a state table because these inputs are not all present at the same time. First we get all by itself x0. Then we get all by itself x1. Then we get all by itself x2. And finally we get the last input x3. So we get these one for each clock cycle. We get clock tick x0, clock tick x1, clock tick x2, clock tick x3. So it takes four ticks of the clock, essentially, to get us the input value. Now the question is, can we output these as we go? All right, well, let's look at it. So, um, so we're going we're gonna to first do the state graph. So here is kind of how the state graph looks, OK? And uh, for some reason, it displays everything. I thought I built it up one at a time. I don't know. Maybe I didn't. Let me see. So, nope, I guess not. Okay, so that's fine, no problem. So, I'm gonna raise me up here. Maybe I am. All right, so, oops. Okay, now, we start in, we start in, uh, and again, uh, the book uses letters instead of S0, S1, S2, S3, S4. I don't know why the book does this. It drives me crazy. They introduce a, a standard uh, model, the notation for a standard, uh, uh, you know, sequential design model, and then they immediately don't use it. That's ridiculous, right? But anyway, so these are states. So A is the first state. That would be S0. And, 
And if we're in A, and we have a single input, x. The first x comes in, it's either a 0 or a 1. All right, so do we know what value to output? All right, so how, do, how can we figure this out? The only thing we can do is go back to this table here and look at it. So we, if we get a, let's say we get a 0 for x. In this case, we'd output a 1. Let's say we get a 1 for x. In this case, we'd output a 0. But here's another case where we get a 0. What would we output? Oh, look, a 1 again. Here's another 0, a 1. Here's another 0, a 1. Here's another 0, a 1. And, and then look, here's a 1, we output a 0. 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 So if we get a 0, we always output a 1. If we get a 1, we always output a 0. So apparently, when this first value comes in, we can immediately output the first value for, for our XS3 code, Z0. So we get X0, we can output Z0. All right, so if we get a 0, we'll output a 1, and this is a melee. So the, the left side numbers are the inputs, and the right side numbers are the outputs. And I should have made these red and blue. Uh, maybe I'll do these first two just for grins. Uh, <clears throat> I'll do this real quick, just so you kind of know, but I'm not going to do them all. So this should be uh, red, and this should be red, and then this should be blue, and this should be blue. All right. All right. There we go. So... I didn't do them all, but I did these. So the red represents the input, x, and the blue represents the output, z. So we get in the first value for x, and we output the first value for z. In this case, we get a 0, we output a 1, and 1 output a 0. All right, let's say now we're in this mode where we got our first value was a 0. There are two possibilities when we're in this mode. One would be a 0, and one would be a 1. Now, can we figure, is it the case that we can already predict what our output would have to be. Well, of course, I put the numbers in so you can you already know that the answer is yes, but let's look at it. So if we get 0, 0, what is it all? Do we always output the second bit? The first output would be a 1, and the next output would be a 1? Let's look. Let's see if that's true. Okay, so where are the cases where we have 0, 0? Here's 0, 0. So what is the second, what is the Z1? The Z1 is a 1. Where do we have another 0, 0? Here. So 0 for x0, 0, 0 for x1, what is the z? It is 1, 1, just like it was up here. And here's one more case where we have 0 and 0, 1 and 1. So in every case where we have a first input is 0, the second input is 0, our outputs are 1 and 1 respectively. So we can output a 1 here. What about over here? We get a 0 in and then we get a 1. Did we Do we correctly, is this right? Uh, do we output a zero? Well, let's look. So, uh, so we get our first one in is a uh, zero, and our second one in is a one. So this pattern is zero one, zero one. And uh, x zero is a zero, x one is a one. So what is that value for x for z one? Well, here it's zero. In fact, one zero. So where else do we have a zero and a one? Here. Z this 0 and 1, and what do we get? Yes, the first value is a 1, and the next value is a 0. So uh, so, it, so we can predict that our z1, if we get a pattern of uh, 0, 1, we will, in fact, put out uh, 1, 0. All right. So, uh, so here's our b. So if we get a, a 0, we're putting out a 1 and going here to d. If we get a 1, so we, our first input's a 0, and we output a 1. Our next input's a 1, and we output a 0. And that will keep us totally on track if we do that. Okay, and now let's go ahead and look at this side over here. C, same thing. Our first value is a 1. Our second value is a 1. Where does that put us? So 1, 1. 1, 1 is right here. So x0, x1 is 1, 1. And our outputs would be 0, 1. So it's, uh, yeah, so, so 1, 1. So our, our second value then is a 1. 
and here we have 1, 1 again. Our second value is a 1. So since our second value is a 1, sorry, then we get a 1, and a second 1, we output a 1. The first one, we output a 0. The second one, we output a 1. And that takes us to G. If, on the other hand, we get a 1 and then a 0, what value should we output then? Well, yeah, so let's see. Uh, I have to look at this. Uh, second value is a 1. So, um, I, I don't know. I'm staring blankly in the space. Oh, I went the wrong way. That was the deal. Okay. Uh, so here we are at C. So we get a 1 and a 1. We output a 1. What if we get a 1 and a 0? Well, so we go back here. Where are our values? 1 and 0, 1 and 0, 1 and 0. So what did we get? For this line, it's 0, 0. For this line, it's 0, 0. And for this line, it's 0, 0. So our second value for Z, our Z1 value, whenever we have a 1 and then a 0, our Z1 value, our Z1 value should be a 0. And for that matter, our Z0 value is also a 0. All right? So we get a 1 and then a 0. We output a 0. And that takes us to E. Okay, now we've covered uh, the two possibilities for B, the two possibilities for C, and of course we've already covered the two possibilities for A. So now we have to go through the same uh, uh, assessment with D, E, F, and G, or D, F, E, G. So let's say we get 0, 0, and 0. What should we output? All right, let's look and see. So 0, 0, 0, that would be this line. 0, 0, 0 gives us 1, 1, 0. Okay, any other examples of zero, zero, zero? Yes, here, zero, 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 one, one, zero. Look, it's exactly the same. So now we know that our, our Z2, if we get in zero, 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 our Z2, can, we can immediately output Z0, Z1, and Z2, one, one, zero. And that's also true down here, one, one, zero. All right, so, so we do output a zero. One, one zero are our outputs. What if we get zero zero one? All right. Well, if we get zero zero one, then uh, then what do we get here? Zero zero one. So where do we have zero zero one? Zero zero one. We have it there. Where else? Anywhere else? Nope. That's the only place. So in this case, we know we can figure it out because whatever it is, it can be. So zero zero one is one one one. That's what comes out. So we get those three inputs, and we have to cover the this 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 is the output for that point. All right. Uh, so zero zero one, we're going to output a one. So zero zero one one, we output a one. What about zero one zero zero one zero? Okay. So if we have sorry, if we have zero one zero zero. One zero. That would be here. Where else do we have another zero one zero? Nope. That's the only place it occurs. Right here. Zero one zero. So what is our third value here? Zero one zero. So we'd output a one, a zero, and a one. So the third value is a one. So whenever we get this expression or this sequence of zero one zero, our s our z two would be a one. All right. So z uh, zero. 1, 0, and that Z2 here, so Z1 is a 1, Z is, sorry, Z0 is a 1, Z1 is a 0, Z2 is a 1, right? Z0, Z1, Z2. All right, now what if we get 0, 1, 1? What do we output? All right, let's go look at that. 0, 1, 1, and we see that right here. 0, 1, 1. And what do we output? We output uh, that turn. Well, that turns into um, so it's the only place it occurs. So zero one 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 zero zero. So that last that the the when we get in x two of one, we can immediately output a z two of zero with that pattern. So zero zero one, and we output the zero. All right. What if we get a one 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 one. What should we output? Well, one one one. 
right here. That's the only time I see that. And 111, we output a 010. That's the pattern. So 010, 0, 1, 0, 0, 1 Uh, did I do that right? Let's see. I don't know. Zero one. Uh, which one was I up to? I'm, I'm up to this one. I'm up to one. one oh, maybe I was up to one zero zero. Oh, I can't even remember. No, I think I did that one. I think I'm up to one zero one. I don't know. All right. One zero one. One zero one. Uh, reading from the one zero one. The only time it appears is here. And we put out zero zero zero. All right. So one zero one zero zero zero. And then how about one one zero? One 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 zero. Uh one one zero is here, and we put zero one one. Zero one one. And then how about one 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 how about one one one? Maybe I started with that. I think I did actually. One one one. It only appears here, and it's zero one zero. Okay, zero one zero for the outputs. All right. Well, anyway, and then finally, we're down. We're all down to these nodes: H, L, J, N, I, M, K, and P. I don't know why they did the order in a funny way, but okay. So there's there's a couple of tricky things here. First off, notice um, L. All we have is uh, we only have one output, so so let's trace it out. So what what do we do if we get zero 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 zero? Well, we output three one one zero zero. What if we what if we have zero 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 one? Well, we output one. Z one uh, z sorry, we output. Uh, Well, we output, uh, so, sorry, we have 0, 0, 0, 1. So that is 9, okay? No, that's 8. So we should output 11. 1, 1, 0, 1, okay? And that is 11, backwards. So the higher order value is 1, 0, 1, 1, actually. All right, so that all checks. So basically, we have to figure out all these. It's a little bit of a pulling your hair out exercise. But notice, notice here, what happens when we have 0, 0, 1, 1? There's no link. What's up with that? Well, the deal there is uh, it's a don't care. So, uh, so you still have to count it, but, uh, but I didn't list it because it should never occur. Okay? Uh, but obviously, you'd, I don't know what you'd output but some garbage thing, and you just go back. But you got to choose that. You don't have to assign it because it should never occur, so it's a don't care. All right, and then here we have uh, 0, 1, 0, 0, and so let's look at the chart. So z the input would be 0 first, then 1, and then 0, 0. All right, so 0, 1, 0, 0, and we output a 0 on that last one, and sure enough, we do. All right, and then what if we got uh, 0, 1, uh, 0, 1. Well, uh, that then is uh, A, or 10, so it doesn't, uh, it's a don't care. And, um, okay, and then we have uh, 0, 1, 1, 0. Our, uh, so that would be uh, 6. And so six plus three is nine. So then we put out one, zero, zero, one, and that checks. Okay. So if you go through, you'll see all these are correct. And the don't cares have just been left off because they should never occur. So we don't really need to specify them and we can choose them however we want. And so this is our first value in. Our B and C are the, represent the second values in. The D, E, F, G uh, represent the third. And all these down here represent the fourth. And when the next value comes in, well, so really A is beginning of nothing. So B is the first value, C is the second, this row is the third, and then the return back to A is the fourth. Uh, because remember, this is a melee, so our inputs are associated with, well, the outputs, in the, the outputs are associated with the links, 
not the nodes. And so, um, so now, how, how can we implement this with a state machine? Well, so we would take this state graph and we turn it into a state table. How many states? Well, we have one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, 10, 11, 12, 13, 14, 15. We have 15. So in this, here's our unreduced state table with 15 states. One, three, seven, eight, nine, 10, 11, 12, 13, 14, 15. Now, this is the type of problem where we're, where we're reading in a fixed number of inputs and resetting. In this problem, we're reading four in and resetting. We read in four bits of our binary coded decimal, and that completes the BCD code. And then it turns out we can actually immediately send out four bits of, uh, of our uh, XS3 code. And we can send out, as soon as we receive bit one on the input, we can send bit one on the output because we can predict what it's gonna be without waiting for additional bits. Uh, just getting the first bit, we know we output, if it's a one, we get a zero, we output a zero. If we get a zero, we output a one. And the second bit, we, there's a little bit of a pattern there, but, and we figure that out. And so we can predict what we're gonna get based on, on this next bit and so forth for all, all four bits. So as you look at this table, do you see, so this gives us the chance to look at redundant states. We don't have to do the implication chart here. We can just look, we can just eliminate redundant states because it fits the fixed number of uh, inputs in and a reset. All right, so do you see any rows, including don't cares, which can assume any value you want. Do you see any rows that, uh, that where you have the same next states and the same outputs? Well, obviously H has A, A and zero, one. So does I. And then for all practical purposes, so does J, K and L. Because of the don't cares, we can choose this to be whatever we want. We can make it A and we can make this one. So our first one, two, three, four, uh, five states, or five states here, have exactly the same next states and the same inputs, including uh, substituting what we want for don't cares. And then these last three, because they have a slightly different output, they all have the same next states and the same outputs as well. Given that, we can eliminate all but, all but state M we can, so we can get rid of P and N and substitute M for those. And we can get rid of L, K, J, I and substitute in H for all of those. So when we do that, we cross out those, we cross out those and we replace all those with H's and these two with M's. All right, now we get to look at it again. Do you see are there any states now that have the same next states? So it looks like, yeah, it looks like E and F both have HM and a one zero, HM and a one zero, and oh, look, G2, HM and a one zero. So uh, we, can, we can eliminate G and F and uh, substitute E in for them. And I think that's it for now. So we eliminate those two, we substitute in E's for those. Now do you see any more states? Let's see, so we have D, E, 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 H, 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 M. Yep, that looks like that's everything. So now we're done. Okay, so once we're done, guess what? We've eliminated a lot of states. So we only have T0, T1, T2, T2, uh, yeah, T1, T1. T2, 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 and T3. And this one down here, okay, uh, H and M. So our, our final states are A, B, C, D, E, H, M. So one, two, three, four, five, six, seven states left. So here it is, A, B, C, D, E, H, M. All right. and. Uh, now we could do an implication chart to see if there if there are any equivalent states, but uh, I didn't do that because I don't think there are. But uh, that might not be a bad thing to do. All right. So. So now we have this as our reduced state table. What is our next step? I'm listening. Ah, you say flip flop state assignment. Yes, that is correct. 
So now we're going to choose how to represent these with our flip-flops. Now we have one, two, three, four, five, six, seven states. What's the minimum number of flip-flops we can use to represent our uh, seven states? Oh, you said three? Very good. That's right. You need three flip-flops at a minimum. We could actually do one more state with three flip-flops, but if we had two more states, we'd have to go to four flip-flops uh, or more, whatever. But we only have seven states, so we can do three with one don't care state. Now, remember the rules we covered in 15. So with, with this number of states, seven states, there's no way. I think there's 500 some or whatever the number was. I don't remember, but it's a big number. So instead of trying to, um, instead of trying to um, brute force it and test every possible non-equivalent state, which would be hundreds, we, uh, we're just going to use the rules. Okay, so the, so the two rules for states, uh, there's three rules really. Two, two refer to the next states and one refers to the outputs. So the two next state rules, states that have the same next states should have adjacent assignments. And states that are the next states of the same state should have adjacent assignments. So uh, here we have, um, so E and D both have H as the next state. So they probably ought to be together. And... Uh, here, B and C both have uh, E as the next state, so they probably should be together. But look, look at this. B and C are the next states of A, so they definitely should have uh, adjacent assignments. D and E are the next states of B, so they should have adjacent assignments. E should have a, E and E are adjacent. They're going to be identical, in fact, so will H and H. And then H and M should probably have adjacent assignments. And then A, who cares, but H and M probably should have general uh, adjacent assignments for a couple of reasons. So when it's all said and done, we should be looking for D and E, E and E, uh, H and M, and uh, that's probably it. All right, now let's do that. So how do we make sure we get adjacent assignments? Well, we're going to use three flip-flops, Q1, Q2, and Q3. And we make a little state, we make a little K-map to do the assignment. This is not for solving, this is not for uh, determining the, our logic here. This K-map is for flip-flop state assignment. Uh, uh, sorry, this K-map is, is just an aid to help us do flip-flop state assignment. It's not the K-maps that we're going to use to solve the problem. Okay, you don't even have to do this, but we want them. We want A and B to be adjacent, so it's it's easier just to put them in this K map, and now you see they're obviously adjacent. Uh, B and C are adjacent, H and M are adjacent, D and E are adjacent, and then also it turns out M and E and H and uh, D are also adjacent. So 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 we've made quite a few things adjacent, and uh, you can mix them around until you feel like you've done the best you can to solve the problem. And then for the output, states that have the same outputs uh, should be adjacent. Well, that's really more of a more thing than it is a melee, because the melees depend on the next inputs too. So uh, so that's, so states don't really have uh, same outputs. So this is more for, for, for more appropriate for mores. Okay, all right, so now, uh, now we're going to do the state assignment, and and so here they are. A is going to be zero 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 zero. B is going to be one zero zero. C is going to be one zero one, and so forth. So we substitute these values in using our flip flops of Q one, Q two, Q three. Normally our flip flops are labeled A B C, but this time we did the states with the A B Cs. So we have to come up with something else, and here we did Q one, Q two, Q three. And normally our states are S zero, S one, S two, and so forth. Why they changed the nomenclature, I don't know, but that's what they did. I'm just copying the book. All right, so here, when we substitute in the uh, the uh, assignments, then uh, then we we have to put in our code. So this is our state table, and then our transition table looks like this. So our Q1, Q2, Q3, we go ahead and this is present state, present state zero. Uh, well, what we did. Uh, Actually, so if we look at this, present state A is 0, 0, B is, is, is 4, C is 5, D is 7, E is 6, H is 3, M is 2. 
So we're gonna, when, once we get these assigned, I'm gonna change the order around so that they're in binary order. So if you think about it, they'll actually line up in our, in our transition table, A, M, H, B, C, E, D. So they're not in order by A, B, C, D, E, e H, M. Okay, they're, they're only in order by, um, by, the, by the binary weighting of their, uh, of their state. And, and so anyway, so, so, so now they're basically lined up A, B, well, no, that's not right. Well, anyway, so here's our transition table. Well, here's our state table. Now in our transition table, I should really put the states in. This would be A, but this is four. So that, well, this is, okay. This is in, not in binary order. I did this in A, B, C, D, uh, H, M, I think. But then you'd rearrange it in binary order to make this work correctly. All right. So now it's in binary order by Q1, Q2, Q3. But the states are not alphabetical, if that makes sense. So we actually have state 0 here, that's our state A here. But this is not B, that is, uh, that is, um, that's, where is it? Oh, well, we don't even have one. So it goes zero, ones that don't care, two, three, yeah. So one is the don't care, actually. So, yeah, so one's the don't care. And then we also have a don't care here. Okay, um, because there is no uh, uh, x equals 1 for this. Okay, that's fine. All right, so now we have these values plugged in. Now we have to do k-maps. Okay, we do a k-map for q1, a k-map for q2, a k-map for q3, those, those d inputs, so dq1, dq2, dq3. And then uh, we also have to have for the output, z. We have a k-map for the output. So we're going to have four k-maps. And what are the variables? The variables are going to be our flip-flops, q1, q2, and 3, and our input. Our input takes priority. So we're going to label our four-variable map x, q1 on the top, q2, q3 on the side. X, but when I did it, I wasn't as smart as I am now. And I did it x, q3, and then q2, q1 down the side. Don't ask me why. I kind of mixed them up. Uh, because I clearly have them labeled Q1 is higher over here. Uh, so that was not smart. Anyway, um, so switch this around. But anyhow, you can do it and you can label the axis however you want, but it, it's much harder to get these values plugged in correctly when you don't label the axes correctly. And so I should have labeled them correctly. Maybe I'll fix this someday. Anyway, once you plug the values in, then you can write down the equations. And so this is for uh, this one is Q3s. This is Q2. Turns out Q2 and Q3, uh, Q2 equals Q3, which is kind of interesting. Um, and here's the equation for Q3. And then uh, yeah, so. So this is Q3 and Q2, and so Q3 and Q2, Q1 and Z. So these are, uh, I guess I didn't write the equations out for these, got lazy. Um, well, so this would be, uh, this would be X, Q1. Maybe I'll fix that. So x q1 plus um, plus uh, uh, x prime 
q1 prime. Uh, so x prime q1 uh, prime. And this one has to go. Yeah, I think that's correct. All right, I'm just going to do that one because I'm lazy. But anyway, and we could write this one out too. It's it's got three terms, uh, three three variable terms. So this was easier. All right. Okay, so that's 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 how that's done. All right, now let's uh let's how would we do this same problem? And of course, obviously, then you could build a circuit with these equations. Three gates here, one, two, three, four gates here. Uh, one, two, three, four gates there, and uh, you can reuse that term. Uh, and just and no gate here, just Q three is output. All right. Okay, so how do we do this with the ROM? Well, we use the ROM to implement the combinational portion, and we use the flip flops to hold the state. So. Uh, and, and the ROM is actually very very good about this because you don't really have to simplify the equations at all. You do you should minimize the state table, but once you do that, you're, you're you don't have to do any more minimization or simplification. You definitely want to use D flip flops and not JKs because if you use JKs, you need extra columns, and each column is is a it, it adds that much more to the uh, to the ROM. So how many flip flops are needed? Well, so for the same problem, we need three flip-flops. How many inputs? We have four inputs. How many outputs? We have four outputs. And how many uh, D flip-flops? Three. All right. So the ROM is addressed by inputs and flip-flops, outputs. So, so the ROM has, uh, has uh, one input, X, and three flip-flop outputs. So four inputs to the ROM. And the uh, the ROM has has to have an output for all the outputs. So it has to have one for each flip flop D input and one for the Z. So it has to have at least four outs. All right. So this drives the number of rows and address lines. This drives the number of output columns. Okay. So uh, use the same state table from the code converter. Seven states coded by three flip flops. One input, one output. So now we can do a truth table using the inputs and current flip-flop states to generate the next states and desired output. So here's our transition table in binary order. Okay, remember these are not. This is an A B C D, uh, A B C D E H M or whatever or E E uh, H M, uh, A B C D E F H M. Oh, I, I guess we're including a don't care. So A, B, C, D, H, M, don't care. Anyway, uh, and here are don't cares. And here, here's also the next states coded by the flip-flops. So we're in state 0. And uh, if our next state is a 0, then, then we're going to state 1. If our next state is a 1, we're going to state 2. And so forth. And those are the outputs. Okay. Again, we just get this straight off the state graph and off the well off the state table. And when we generate this, then you only tricky thing is remember our actual state table back here is is it's the initial transition table isn't in binary order. Okay, we we preserve every row and rearrange it so it's in binary order to make it easier to uh, map it from our transition table into the ROM or into KMAPS. So now it's in binary order. We didn't, we didn't switch any of the content of the rows up at all. All we did was we kept all the rows the same. We just moved them around. Here, you don't, your, our don't cares with, for, for row 1, we're at the bottom. And here, we moved row 1 up into its row 1 position. But we preserved all these don't cares just like they were. And we preserve all these outputs and next states coding just like they are. But you do have to rearrange the rows in binary order to make it easy to plug it into KMAPS and to our ROM. All right, now, so uh, when we do the, so here's our transition table, exactly the same one we had before, haven't changed a thing. 
and here's our ROM. So we have we have our in, our four inputs, our input or well our our four independent variables I should say, x, and then the three states of the flip flops. All right. And then here are our outputs, our output Z and our three next states. So if we're in 0, 0, and X is a 0, our desired next, our, our output is a 1, our desired next state is 0, 0, 1. All right? And that is true, which, which in this case would be B. So we go from A to B. If we're in B and our input is a 0, our next state is 3 and our output is a 1. And down here, if we're in 3, our next state is 5, if our input's 0. If, on the other hand, our input down here, say we're in 3 and our input's a 1, well, then we'd be going to, uh, we'd be going to, uh, our output would be a 1, and we'd be going to 5. So you do have to, you, this is, you just have to get this right. It's not that difficult, but you must get this copied over correctly. And the way we do it, because we have x0 here and x1 here, we copy all this information here, just like this, 0, 0, 1, 0, 1, 1, and so forth, followed by this information. So there's one don't care at the end, and then we have these two don't cares. And here it is. 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, 7, and the don't care, and then 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, and two don't cares. Okay? So the only difference is, notice here x is 1, so that's why we have this column at the bottom of the table. And where x is 0, we have these columns. Here x is 0, and then we have the q's. Here x is 1, we have the q's. And the same for the output. So, so the next states and the output. Now, what's really pretty cool about this is now... Uh, we don't we didn't have to do k maps or any simplification or anything okay this is all we had to do uh it's complete and now uh if we so this is what populates the rom the yellow part so we're going to take this information and put it straight into the rom and we're going to address the rom in hierarchical order with z going so that, so how many address lines there're going to be four address lines 16 rows the higher order address line is going to be address line 3, and then 2, 1, and 0. Z is going to be connected to address line 3. Q1 to address line 2. Q2 to address line 1. And Q3, and these are these are not the outputs, these are the next state inputs, which means those are the D inputs. Because they're the Q1 plus, Q2 plus, Q3 plus. And so, so, so these outputs, output 0, 1, 2, and 3, go in this order to their three flip-flops, and then the output 3 goes to Z. That's our Z output. Our inputs are just our current states and our next input, X. And so those are the four independent variables, and here are the dependent variables. And there are three flip-flops. Now, why do we have to have flip-flops? Well, because uh, the ROM has all this information stored in it, but it doesn't know what state it's in. We have to we have to remember what state we're in at any given moment by these three flip-flops, which are allowed to change value as, as our state machine runs. Whereas the ROM does not change value while the state machine runs. Once it's programmed, the ROM is fixed. It holds those values and never changes. So even though you can think of it, it's a read-only memory, that sounds like memory. Couldn't we remember our state? Well, only if you can change it dynamically while the, while the machine runs. Our flip-flops can change dynamically by the clock, but notice the ROM has no clock. The ROM is a combinational device. It does not have a clock. The flip-flops are sequential devices. They are controlled with a clock and also their asynchronous inputs, potentially. All right? So that's what that looks like. Okay, let's see how we're doing on time. I don't want to take forever. I might finish this up. Um, we're at 49 minutes. Uh, let me just talk one real briefly about iterative design. And uh, So we've talked about iterative design before. Remember what iterative design is, okay? Iterative design is when you take uh, a, a simple circuit and you replicate multiple copies of it 
in space to create a to like for instance an adder if you want to you take a one bit full one bit adder one bit of a one bit of b a carry in generates a sum and a carry out okay so that's a full one bit adder if you want a four bit adder where you have four bits of a four bits of b and one carry in and you generate four bits of sum and one carry out that that is you you can hook up four one bit adders in a, in a row and you can pass the carry out to the carry in of the next one bit adder and so forth your initial carry in is the this the carry in for the for the four bit adder and your final carry out is the carry out for the four bit adder and you have then these internal carry signals so that's an iterative design and you can also do the so you can definitely do these for adders you can do them for comparators you can do them for a number of things uh, what you have to what you have to do is you have to ask yourself uh, how many signals have to be passed from one module to the next and what direction do they have to travel now what's really interesting at least to me and hopefully to you is that for the adder the signals pass from lower bit to higher bits but in a comparator it's just the opposite we always compare the highest order bits first why do we do that well we we do that because our higher order bits uh, if, if say you're comparing A and B let's say the higher order bit in A is a 1 and the higher order bit in B is a 0 do the other say it's a 4 bit uh, it's a 4 bit vector do the other three bits besides those higher order bits make any difference whatsoever in which number is bigger no once once you've already found out that 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 A3 is a 1 and B3 is a 0 you know A is bigger than B it doesn't matter what B2 B1 and B0 are and what A2 A1 and A0 are A is bigger than B because A3 is bigger than B3 therefore the whole 4-bit integer or 4-bit vector is clearly bigger and so that's why in a comparator you always compare the high values first and the way a comparator works uh, how much information do you have to pass are you passing just one bit of information <coughs> well no you have a you have a one bit comparator module it compares one bit of a to one bit of b it takes in signals that from a higher order bit that tell you whether it's whether a is bigger than b whether a equals b or whether a is less than b so you actually have three you actually have three things you have to pass is it bigger than bigger than less than or equal and that takes two bits to pass those three pieces of to pass three possible pieces of information with a carry you only have yes a carry no a carry so that only takes one one bit of information because you have two things that you have to consider but in a comparator you have three things you have to consider greater than less than or equal so you have to pass two bits and because of that you have to pass them from the higher order to the lower order because you must you must send the information from the lower order comparison downstream to the uh, sorry you have to send information from the high order comparison down to the lower order because it trumps everything else so when we do when we do the adder the information is flowing from low order to high order in the way the carry goes when we do it a comparator our information is flowing from the high order comparison to the low order and then when we get down here we put a little circuit that allows us to sort out whether we have whether x is less than y x is greater than y or equal to y and of course if our if here in the second stage we've determined that x is greater than y then it will always be greater no matter what the rest of these comparisons show the only comparison then that that can be affected is if is if when you're past the information uh, is it says that the a, that at this point x and y are equal so if, if x and y are equal and x and y are equal and x and y are equal and they're here then when you get down to this bit this then this final comparison would determine whether x is bigger than y or y is bigger than x or if they're the same but if it's already determined up here then this comparison doesn't add anything whatsoever all right um, and here's how you could take this 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 uh, this circuit here which is a which is a uh, essentially a sequential design in space and turn it into a sequential design in time by uh, 
by saving the bits you need, the information you need to pass from cell to cell in flip-flops. With our adder, we just needed one flip-flop to save the carry, but with the comparator, we need two because we have two, two, we have three possible states. We have to use two bits to encode it, and we have one bit that's a don't care in that setting. All right, um, so I'm not going to say much more than that about this. Uh, we can go through this iterative design. Uh, these are the possibilities. These are the states, and here's our two bits, our x and y that we're passing, and those are our, uh, these are our outputs, uh, which indicate whether it's greater than, less than, or equal. All right, uh, and anyway, here's how you could do it sequentially, uh, but we're not going to do this. All right, I, I'm going to come back and I'll talk about this and finish this up at the end. Okay, so I think with that I'm going to quit. We'll come back. Uh, I'll finish the last of this up on Monday, and then we'll probably jump into 17 and keep going because I want to have plenty of time to review for the final and I think that's it so we'll see you all later